so much for being here. My name is Brendan Lowe, creator and founder of Jazz Piano School, and this is a live podcast recording, episode number 222. Now, thank you all so much for showing up. We have members and non-members on this particular public uh, podcast recording. So the way it works is that I'm going to record the podcast. You'll clearly see when I'm going to record, start recording. And essentially, when I say recording, I'm already recording, but we edit it down so that there's a clear beginning and end. Um, so hello to everyone, Bruce, Jay, Trevor, William. Um, again, these are people that I have relationships with it because they're Jazz Piano School members. If you're not a Jazz Piano School member, definitely uh, encourage you to check out all the information we have at jazzpianoschool.com. And um, that's about it. I, have, uh, I live on a second story, and it's funny because our roof, the roof is very um, thin, I guess. And so right now, before I just started the podcast, there's like, I hear animals running across the roof all the time, like chasing each other, like squirrels. And I mean, this, this just now, it sounded like a big animal, <laughs> a big animal, like two big squirrels or like even cats. I have no idea, but uh, it's, it's pretty funny and distracting at this moment because they keep chasing each other back and forth. Crows get up there, probably raccoons, who knows, but yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, hey, Shell, hey, Sarah, thank you guys all so much for being here. At the end of the recording... I'm going to take questions from everyone on the podcast that I've taught, okay? And so essentially after I'm done recording, I'll answer any questions that you guys have about the podcast and yeah, I'm very, very excited to do that. Now today's podcast is going to be on Blues Reharms Part 2. So I'm going to be going a little bit further into Blues Reharms, into how to use them and essentially... Um, you know, all that good stuff. It's going to be more intermediate to advanced. If you didn't check out Blues Reharms Part 1, that podcast, 221, I definitely recommend you go back and watch that because it's really, really informative. Got a, a lot of amazing feedback on that, but this is going to be going further and I'm going to be going more in depth into Blues Reharms and all that good stuff. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to get started here and then, yeah, then we'll I'll, I'll answer some questions. All right, so here we go. All right, welcome to the Jazz Piano School podcast, episode number 222. My name is Brendan Lowe, creator and founder of Jazz Piano School. Thank you so much for being here. So in this particular episode, I'm going to be going over Blues Reharm. This is going to be the Blues Reharm part two. I'm going to be going more in depth on how to use the four Blues Reharms I talked about in the previous episode. Now, if you haven't checked that out, definitely go check out podcast 221 because I'm going to be using all those elements to go even further than I did last week and talk to you more in depth about Blues Reharms. If you're new to jazzpianoschool.com, definitely go check out all of the free education we have available. And with that being said, here we go. So with blues reharms, essentially, I talked about four different types of reharms last week. Now, I just want to cover those real quick. I talked about number one, the tritone substitution. Right? And so that's just a 2-5-1 there. I'm just using some rootless voicings. Now, our tritone substitution is going to be substituting one dominant chord for the other dominant chord. So for example, if I were to play an F7... I could also play a B7 in place of this. Now, how does this help the, us? It allows us to substitute and reharm, but it also allows us to provide movement within the blues. So for example, if I play an F7 and I want to get some movement happening in my harmonies, I can move from F7 to B7 in order to approach my four chord, the, the B flat seven. So there's two ways we can really use our tritone reharm. We can use it within a progression to substitute, for example, in a two, five, one, right? Um, at the end of the fourth, fourth measure in the blues, when usually you'll hear a two, five, one, two, five, one, going to our four chord, right? We can substitute the tritone in for the F7. So here's our two, five. Now, instead of going to this dominant, we can go two, five to the four, right? So that's one way to use the tritone. The other way to use the tritone is like I just mentioned. If we want to add some movement, we can go one, add some movement. Now all we're doing here is changing the sound. We're still technically on the same chord, right? So we're still technically on a chord that sounds like B7 or F7. Remember, they share the same shells. So this way, 
we're not really doing much. We're just changing the root and changing where the extensions and colors are. Right? So this adds some harmonic movement. Instead of the bass just being this for four beats, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we now have this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Right? So we've added some walking bass motion to approach our four chord just purely with the use of the tritone substitution. That was reharm one I talked about. Reharm number two I talked about was the relative two minor. Okay, now any dominant chord, any dominant chord, all of them, they have a relative two minor sibling chord. For example, this F minor seven, it has a sibling minor chord that I can play before this F seven chord. Right? And you want to think about this in terms of a 2-5-1. So if this is the 5 chord, what would the 2 chord be to this F7? It'd be a C minor 7 chord. Right? So I could go C minor, F7, and then go to my B flat. And in fact, that's exactly what happens usually in a jazz blues at the end of the fourth measure right? to get us to the 4 chord. Okay? Now, with the relative 2 minor, if you don't really know your 2 fives, don't worry. You can simply find the relative 2 minor to any dominant chord by simply going up a fifth or down a fourth. So for example, if you have a B flat seven chord and you wanna find the sibling relative to minor, you can go up a fifth, you can find the F, and we now know that F minor seven is gonna be the sibling chord to B flat. So anytime you see a B flat, you can play an F minor seven first and then go to your B flat seven. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking that B flat, B flat seven, we're moving it over to beat three instead of beat one, and replacing beat one with this F minor seven for two beats, and then going to our B flat seven. We're, at, we're just adding another step to get to the place that are, we're originally attended on going, right? So that's gonna be reharm number two is the relative two minor. Reharm number three is gonna be secondary dominance. Now the concept of secondary dominance here is if we have a D minor seven, that's resolving down by a fifth to G seven, right? Like they do in two five ones. Check out the bass motion from a 2-5-1. D, G, C. Now if I do that continuously going down here, check out what it looks like. D, G, C. Those are all perfect fifths, resolving down by a perfect fifth. Now, a dominant chord still wants to resolve down by a fifth. So, if I play a D, now you may be thinking, well, why does it want to do that? I'm not gonna get into that now, just take my word for it, okay? It does. Here's our D minor seven. Now, if I put a D dominant seven here, this D dominant seven acts in a very, very similar way to the D minor seven. So that means I can replace this minor chord with a dominant and it still wants to go to G seven. Both these chords, no matter if it's minor or dominant, still wants to go and lead to G seven. Both chords are gonna take us to the same place, so it doesn't matter if I play D minor here or D seven. So I can actually change the harmony to a dominant chord in a two five one. So instead of minor being our two chord, I can make this a dominant. Dominant, dominant, major. Now why is that important? Well, in a jazz blues, if I'm comping through the remaining progression of the blues, when we have a little bit of a turnaround going into the two chord, usually we have this, three, six, two, five, one, right? If I want to replace some of those minor chords with dominant chords to give me some more opportunities, some more options, I can. So remember, I played minor, dominant, minor two, dominant. So I have two chords that I can replace. I can replace this A minor seven. I can place that with a dominant. Dominant, dominant, dominant. I can replace the two chord with a dominant here and then dominant. Right, so I've changed the options. Now, why is this important? Dominant chords allow us to do so much more as you're about to see later in this podcast. I'll get into that later, okay? The last remaining reharm, four reharms, again, for the Jazz Piano School members, these are the four most important reharms you're gonna wanna start with, is gonna be the sus reharm. Any dominant chord we can turn into a sus chord, right? This means a suspended four. So instead of this, you can play this. Four to three. Okay, this is gonna create a sound like this.
right? The suspended sound is rear, a very modern sound. It also provides us with more voice leading options, more harmonic options, more colors, more movement within the harmonies, lots and lots of different options, all right? So just to re recap again, we have four different reharms that I'm gonna be digging into today. The tritone, the relative to minor, the dominant, secondary dominant, and the sus, all right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a uh, full screen here, essentially, so that you can see all of the music that I'm going to be talking about. All right. So for the um, video listeners and watchers right now, you can see uh, some progressions on the screen along with my keyboards as well. Right. So the power of essentially our reharms right now at this point is that we can start to combine the reharms. We can start to combine them. And this is what's going to make these four reharms so powerful, right? Check it out. In the very first measure of the blues, if we simply use a tritone by itself, we can go F, tritone, to the four. This is all within the first measure. Check it out again. So one, two, three, four, one. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm using a tritone sub for the F. Now, I'm not substituting necessarily. I'm just moving to that other option. It's like a variation of the F7. Remember, B7 is just a variation of F7, so I'm simply moving to that variation. F for two beats, B7 for two beats into the four chord. I've created movement, okay, with my reharm. Now... Again, by the, the blues by itself doesn't even contain this four chord really on the second measure. I'm adding that in. It's like a, an, another variation of the blues, but a traditional blues would just be the one chord, right? The F7 chord. I'm adding this B flat seven in, okay? And again, that's slightly traditional, but now I've taken this and I've added some movement with the tritone going into the four chord, okay? Now, since I've added this tritone, what I can do here is, is, is I have two other options, reharms, that I can add to this. What are they, right? What two other reharms can I do to this tritone sub that I've now added in? I can use the sus on this, and I can use the relative two on this, right? Because it's a dominant chord. So remember, with all dominant chords, you can use the sus, and you can use the relative two, right? I've already used the tritone, so that's out of the picture. But I have two others I can still apply because I've, I've now created a tritone sub here. So what I can do is I can go tritone, excuse me, one chord to the tritone, right? Let's apply the sus here. So I'm gonna voice this as a sus chord now. I've now turned my tritone into a sus reharm, right? So now instead of the three, I have the four here. Before I had the three here, right? I'm just going to play shells now. One, three, seven, three. So I have my one chord, shells, this is traditional dominant seven, one chord, sus. You hear how that changes the, the sound, right? And if I add some colors to that, right, I'm adding the nine in natural 13, right? That's coloring up the sus, okay? I've added my own personal colors to the sus. So I can go one, sus. I don't have to resolve to the dominant, but I could. And then I could lead into my four chord. All right, did you hear that quick resolution? Now I have to get the resolution in quick because I only have like one beat, right? One, two, three. I could, uh, yeah, I have one beat. Three, four, one. Now that doesn't sound as hip, right? Because I'm, I'm playing on the chord notes. One, two, three, four. I mean, it could be if you want that walking style, you could also anticipate it. One, two, three, and, right? Three, and, and then maybe pop it a little bit with some short comping. One, two. Now, all I did there to change the sound and the texture was I dropped my left hand down to the low end of the piano, and this is something that students miss a lot. I just drop my left hand down to the super low end of the piano to get some richness, richness, excuse me, some lush sound, texture out of the low end of the piano. I should probably get that third in there. <laughs> right? 
So now I'm using the sus, resolving to the tritone, which is an option, and then moving to the four chord. Let's try the other reharm that we talked about. We had two reharms available, right? We had the sus and we had the relative to minor. So what would be the relative to minor to this dominant chord? What's the sibling minor chord to B7? All right, think about it. If you guys can answer in your head, that's great. If not, so remember, if you know your two fives, two, five, one. If B7 is the five chord, the two is gonna be F sharp. Our one chord in the key of E would be E. If you don't know your two fives too well, then all you have to do is go down by a perfect fourth or up by a perfect fourth, and you can find that sibling relative two. Now, as I said before, what can I do with my relative two minor? I can place the relative two minor before the dominant chord. So I can slide my dominant chord over beat-wise, rhythm-wise, right? And I can place my F-sharp minor seven before it, which will lead into my B7 chord. Check it out. Here's my one chord. Okay, so I'm gonna play my one chord for two beats. One, two. Here's my F sharp minor seven. One, two, and then into the four chord. Okay, now this reharm you may hear a lot. Like it's all throughout bebop. It's all throughout the bebop language. It's a very, very common reharm that once you start to hear it and understand it, you're like, oh my God, that's gonna be a relative two minor combined with the tritone. So a lot of times in a two, five, one, you'll hear this. Most people don't take it this far. G minor seven, going into your F, your, <coughs> excuse me, your G flat seven, going into your one chord, right? So that's, that's a common tritone sub, but now if we add the relative two to our tritone sub, right? I can go C sharp, G flat seven, F. So if I was soloing or comping, I'd go, So I played C sharp minor seven, G flat seven, into my F major seven. So the root motion looks like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. So we get that two, five, one, right? Now in the blues, I can do the same thing. One, two, three, four. So I'm going F sharp minor seven. My voicings here, guys, I know everyone wants, everyone loves the voicings, right? I don't blame you because they sound great. <laughs> I have my one and seven here. I have my rootless voicing here. And what I'm doing to resolve this, to make it sound like a resolution without adding a B in the bass, right? This right here is resolving to this. I'm resolving these thirds. So I have, but spread out. And usually I will change to my B7 like this. But if you don't want to add that root motion, this also sounds like a resolution. You see that? So rootless voicing, my top pinky is gonna resolve down by a whole step. My seven here is resolving to the third of the B7. So the seven of the F sharp seven is resolving to the third of the B7. And then into my four chord on the blues, right? I just did it again, right? So on our two, five, one, leading into our, our four chord on measure five, usually, right? As you can see there in the music on system two, okay, measure nine, five, six, seven, eight, eight, excuse me. We have our two, five, right? Now this is not measure eight of the blues. This is measure eight of the worksheet that's being shown right now. This would be measure four of the blues, okay? We have a two five. So in that two five, we can do the same thing. We can go minor, relative two, to our dominant, to our tritone. Now what if we did this, relative two, and then sus, we could go something like that. So what I'm talking about here is the power of combination, the power of combining different types of reharms to really dive deep into everything that you can do with reharms all over the place. Any single tune, any single blues, it doesn't matter. As long as you learn the reharm tools, you can apply those tools to any tune you want. All right, let's go a little bit further here. I'm just gonna kinda gonna move through some of this blues stuff here.
Now the turnaround here, moving into our two chord, is going to be three, like I played before. Six, two, five, one. Six, right? Two, five, one. Now that's very, very common. That's very, very common to happen is that we have those different types of turnarounds. The three, going to the six, the minor two. Let's start to work on this section now. Let's use all three, all four, excuse me, of our rearms together. We're going to combine all of them together. And I, I, I approached this in the last lesson a little bit. So instead of this minor, we're going to turn this to a dominant. How do we do that? We're using the, the use of our secondary dominant reharm. Because this A minor 7 is still going to D7, this A7 is still going to D7, we can substitute the minor for a dominant. Now, as I, as I was saying before, the power of turning a minor into a dominant chord gives us so many more options. What can we do with a dominant chord? Well, we can add more extensions to our dominant chord. That's one door that's open to us now. With a minor chord, we only have traditionally three extensions that we can add, natural nine, natural 11, and natural 13. Right, with a dominant chord, how many extensions do we have? We've added so many more colors we can add to this dominant chord now. I can play, I can play natural nine and natural 13. I can play flat nine, flat 13, right? I can play sharp nine, flat 13, alter, right? I can play natural nine, flat 13. I can add my sharp 11. I can add my natural 13. We have a slew of different colors now just simply because we've turned that minor chord into a dominant chord. It gives us so many more coloring options. All right, now what else can we do to a dominant chord? Well, we just worked on it. We can now add our sus reharm or our relative to reharm, right? So with this A7 being a dominant chord, I can now add my relative to before this. So I can go E, A, D. G, right? So I added my relative two to approach my A7. And then which leads us into my G minor, right? So what that would sound like would be this. One, two, three, four, one. Now out of context, it doesn't sound that great, but if I'm on my four chord. One, two, added a little bit of a tritone there. So, so you can go one, two, three, four, one, two. You know, there's so many different ways you could add that relative two in. Okay, that's one of the things we could do. We could also make the A7 a sus chord. And then we could resolve that. And then we'd go to our D7. We could make that a sus chord. So we could have A sus, A7, D sus, D7, right? Or we could have relative twos for that whole bar. Instead of one, two, three, four, that's A minor seven for two beats, D seven for two beats. We could add the relative two to both of those chords. The relative two of A seven would be E minor, A seven, right? And then A minor seven to D seven. You hear how that works? And then finally we get to our our two chord. That leads us into our G minor. I went E minor seven, A seven, sharp 11, natural 13, flat nine. And then I went A minor seven, 11, nine, into a, a sharp 11, natural 13, natural nine. Which leads us to our two chord. So the power of adding these relative twos creates more bebop movement, not to mention I can solo over these two fives now. Right? So in that bar, but again, that's two measures each, so it'd be something like that, right? All right, let's strip back our reharms. Let's, let's approach this a different way now. So I'm still gonna leave my secondary dominant over this three chord. Okay, what if we use the, tri let's use the tritone now somehow. So now that we've used the secondary dominant, let's replace this A7 
Okay, let me get rid of the, the music because I'm not really using it. Um, there's not really a point to that, but so you guys can see my voicings a little bit better. So let's let's get rid of the A. Uh, excuse me. So we're on the secondary dominant now. Let's use a tritone now. Because we've made A minor 7 into a dominant, we can now apply the tritone substitution in combination with this. So I can now make the, my A7 an E flat 7. Right? So my progression would start on E flat 7 and move down to D7. Now I can still use all of the same things I just explained to you. I can use sus, sus, and then into my 2 minor. So my progression would sound like this. Right? Now in the blues, in that second system, right, we have one, we have, we're on the four chord for two measures, right? So one, two, three, four, two, two, three, one, two, three, four. Now the third, the fourth measure, or excuse me, I should say the ninth, me eighth measure, I'm sorry, of the blues is really one bar of my A minor seven going to D seven. It's usually, that usually happens in one bar, but what if we spread it out? What if we spread that 2-5 out over two bars? This is going to give us more room to reharm. You also want to be thinking about the room you have with rhythmically, the room rhythmically you have to reharm. Because if you have only have one measure, you can't really do that much with that one measure. But let's spread it out, right? Because we're still trying to get to the 2 chord. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4. Let's go now immediately to the 3 chord. So we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 2. Now we're at the two chord, right? And now, since we've done that, we can start, to, we're getting really advanced here, guys. I understand. This may be way out of a lot of people's comfort zone, but that's okay. But now that we have two measures to work with, we can do so many different things, right? So I can go, I can go a measure of my E flat seven to my D seven. So now my progression would sound like this, B flat for two bars, B flat, E flat, D7, G. Okay, now that's pretty cool. All I did there was use a tritone in place of my A minor. Right? I made my A minor a secondary dominant and then used the tritone. Right? So but but let's apply more reharms to the tritone. So let's make the E flat seven a sus and make our D7 a sus. Right? So I can go four, four, here comes the E flat sus. E flat sus, D sus into my two chord. Okay, let's resolve the sus chords now. All I was doing was staying on the sus the whole time. Sus, sus, right? Let's resolve them now. So I'm gonna go E flat sus, dominant. D sus, resolution. Here's my suspended four. It's resolving down to the three. Here's my suspended four for the D7. It's resolving down by a half step to the three. So now it sounds like this. Four chord. Right, and then so on and so forth. Now instead of a sus, let's make, let's put a relative two minor before the E flat. So instead of e, making the E flat a sus, let's make it a relative two minor. So we're gonna go relative two minor, which is our B flat minor seven to E flat seven. Then we're gonna go A minor seven to D seven. Now remember, the A minor seven to our D seven is the standard changes for a turnaround to the blues, right? So I'm just I'm just adding, simply adding a two five that's a half step above our standard changes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Into the two. So it sounds like this. Here's just shells. Four chord, two, five, two, five, one. Now check it out. If you want to use that for soloing or improvisational purposes, you could do that. Maybe you're on your four chord. And then into your two. So I went B flat minor seven. So I'm soloing over B flat minor seven. Right, you see that? So I'm soloing over my reharm I just created.
love this. I actually have to use this more, right? Now think about it. We have a lot more time because what I'm doing right now is I'm playing two beats per chord, right? Now let's say we were playing a slow blues that was like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, right? We could add even more reharms to every beat dependent upon the tempo, right? So let's go back a second here. And let's go back to our A A7. Now this is gonna get slightly confusing, but bear with me here. Because the chord we wanna to get to is A7, we can play a secondary dominant that leads us to A7 before the A7. Does that make sense? So like if you see a dominant chord or a minor, you can place a dominant chord before this chord, just like we used our relative two minor to get here. So I could go E7 to A7 to D7 to G minor. So like my progression would look like this. It'd be E7, right? One, two, three, four, one, or excuse me. Uh, sorry, I'm counting, counting wrong. <clears throat> so this would be a full measure of E7. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and into the D minor, excuse me, the G minor, right? All right, so let's turn this a little bit more advanced. Since we have an E minor seven now for one full measure, we could add a relative two minor to that. We could go B minor seven, E seven. And then we could move into our previous reharm, B flat minor seven, E flat seven. We could even go further, A minor seven, D seven, right? Now we could even go even further than that. A flat minor seven, right? To D flat seven. Now, how do we get the last two five? The D flat is simply a tritone of G, right? So we're, we're essentially approaching that G seven, right? Early, but then moving to the minor. Does that make sense? Right, so we have, essentially we have four dominant chords, three dominant chords, really. Yeah, four. E seven, E flat seven, D seven, and then G7, which leads us into my G minor. So we're going just down by two fives chromatically. Right, so we wouldn't have time for this in a fast blues, but a slow blues, right? So here's our progression. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And now we get to our progression. One, two, three, then to our two chord, right? Just like that. And again, we could solo over this as well. And again, this is, this is, I'm talking about slow, slow blues. So if I have my, if I'm on my four chord on system two, is like this one two three four right so again you have the power depending upon the speed of the tune to do all sorts of things okay let's step back a little bit I'm just gonna do a couple more for you let's go into our two chord finally and, and talk about what we can do here so Let's do two sus, or sus to resolution, sus to resolution, and then into our two dominant. So I'm gonna go three sus, dominant. This is the tritone of D, okay? So I'm just using a tritone of D and I'm adding the sus. Into our dominant. Now, what I'm gonna do here is on our dominant chord, I'm gonna play the dominant chord for two beats, but then I'm gonna move to the tritone. So I'm gonna go G, tritone, and then into my five chord. So remember, the two chord is for four beats. One, two, three, four, one. I'm gonna create a secondary dominant. One, two, three, four, one, but I'm gonna make the tritone now. One, two, three. I'm gonna make my five chord a sus, 
and then make it a dominant, right? And then I can move into a 3625, maybe all altered. Actually, that was not all altered, excuse me. That was all altered, right? So I'm creating more reharms as the turnaround back to the one. Okay, so here's what it sounds like from the four chord. my mic was getting in the way of my eyes <laughs> but that's essentially like do you hear much how much sound that starts creating over our blues and, and this is just the tip of the iceberg like of all the reharms that I use I mean it literally it I don't even land on the one chord sometimes when I'm going back to the top I can I can just stay on my relative two so for example like if I'm if I have my two five two five here's my turnaround three six two, five, I might just go to my relative two, right? And then from the relative two, I just go to my tritone. Because remember, this is the same thing. Like this is the exact same thing as having F for a full bar and B flat. All I'm doing is putting my relative two to a tritone of F7. So I go. I haven't even talked about the, the four minor. The power is endless here. It's endless. So to recap everything, here's what you want to do. You need to explore. You need to understand each and every component first, right? And you need to explore. I'm sorry about that. And so when you do that, that's essentially how you're going to get into all these different types of sounds. And it's not just with the blues. It's with everything. It's with all different types of sounds. But the first step is to really understand each reharm first by itself by itself right understand the power and the use and the technicality and the theory behind each tool first once you fully grasp each tool and you've you've used it you've practiced it through a theory sequence you've you've implemented it, you know you studied the tool by itself and then implemented it into tunes then you're going to have to then you want to start combining the tools together like i've just shown you in today's podcast and that will open so many doors of possibilities for reharms, comping, improv, right? This is a very key step in improv because a lot of the improv that you hear, it's not based on your right hand. It's based on a lot of stuff I was showing you, right? So if I were to play reharms over all this and solo over it, and you would hear it, right? Uh, let me, what was the reharm I played before? Oh yeah, the B minor seven. Right? D flat, you know, whatever it is, all the reharms, uh, you would think like, what is he even playing? It's not really about the right hand. It's about the theoretical knowledge of the reharms and how they apply to the tune. Like the, the improv is always the same. It stays the same, but the harmonies and the reharms, that's what changes. And a lot of the times it's about the voicing. It's about what the pianist, the jazz pianist is doing underneath or with the harmonies. It's not necessarily about the right hand and, and kind of the licks or the lines that they're playing because those, for the most part, they stay pretty consistent, to be honest with you. 
Like not much changes there, but you add a couple of reharms here and there, and then you solo with that new progression that you've just made. Trust me, you're creating whole new ball games of music, right? Just whole worlds of opportunity to express yourself in different ways. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that podcast. Definitely go to jazzpianoschool.com to check all this out. And uh, as always, have a fantastic day and happy practicing. All right, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks so much for watching. Uh, I'm going to take questions now. Thanks so much, Trevor. I appreciate it. It's a really, it's a, it's a interesting topic. You know, um, improv is really interesting because we get fixated on, it really closely ties into improv because we get fixated on the right hand and in right hand lines. You know, but as a pianist, we have so much more to work with that we always forget about our left hand voicings, our reharms, you know, all those different, there's so much power in the way we voice a certain chord with extensions, colors, the register, the inversion, that'll drastically affects, you know, our, our improv. I'll answer questions in a second. I just want to demonstrate if I'm playing a blues and I just play shells, it's going to sound like this. And then I'll move to my four chord. Right? So that sounds one way. Okay? So what if I change the way I'm voicing my left hand and I play the exact same thing? What if I put a sus here? What if I put a tritone? What if I put a sus chord on the four? And then I move back to my sus. A sus. A flat sus. G sus. C sus. Altered. G sus, excuse me, G altered, C altered. Now the whole time my right hand was playing blues, <laughs> that's about three ses semesters for me. My right hand was playing blues, but like I just want to demonstrate the power of your left hand. Like the left hand, even if you play, if I played simple, more simple, right, it would still sound the same, right? If I do sus. my four sus right so again like that was just all blue scale but my left hand was doing um, all the reharms all right let me let me take some of the questions you guys were asking through here um, this, this stream will be uploaded. Yes, this stream, the podcasts are always made public so you can rewatch them. Um, Seb Bo, po all the po public podcasts I film are, are uploaded to jazzpianoschool.com so you can go watch the video. You can listen to them in your car if you want, through iTunes, through any podcast platform. Um, Alan, what's up? Hey, reharm overload. Yes, it is, it is absolutely reharm overload. And again, the thing about this is like start simple right? Start simple because trust me, like these doors, you know, I've had, I had students, I have students come up with reharms that I've never even played before. Once you have an understanding of how you can move about the harmonies, then like there's so many things you can do, especially shifting chords back and forth with rhythmically. You know, if you add more rhythmic space to something, obviously with tempos or slower, oh my God, it's like, it hurts the brain to think about, right? But just start simple. Just use one or two and then maybe combine two of them, right? Um, Ed says, the relative two minor you mentioned would be the relative, the two in the relative minor of the current key. Is that correct? It's the, it's the relative two, Ed, to the dominant chord. So like, it doesn't matter what key you're in. So like, if I'm playing a, if I'm playing a piece in C, right? I, I don't even know. Um, if I have a two minor in the key of, excuse me, a two, five, one in the key of C, D minor seven, D flat, right? The relative two is gonna be the relative two to the dominant chord. 
So I'm in the key of C. I wouldn't play the any I wouldn't play any two minors in the key of C. I'm gonna play the two minor that is the sibling to D flat seven. So like, well, yes, okay, I, I think I'm, I'm misunderstanding your question. Yes, the relative, what, you wanna find out what key the, the dominant's coming from. So like this D flat dominant is from the key of G flat, right? Because there's only one dominant chords in all keys. So this, because this dominant chord is from the key of G flat, I'm gonna use the two from the key of G flat to get me to that dominant chord. So my reharm two, five, one would be two, right? Here's just with the tritone, tritone, one. Now I'm gonna add the relative two minor. Two, relative two minor, dominant. Both of those chords were from the key of G flat. And then I moved it to C major. I think that's what you were asking, right? So this A flat minor would be from the key of G flat. D flat's from the key of G flat. But again, you don't have to think about it in terms like that, but you can, you know, for modes and improvisational purposes. You can just think D minor seven, and then, you know, the two, the sibling chord, the two minor, a flat, D flat, C. Okay. When improvise, when improvising, and there can be so many changes. Do you change? Do you change scale every most times to match your chord? Is there one parent scale? That's a great question, Jay. So essentially, essentially, when using reharms. You have so many different colors you can use with your improvisation and ways to approach it. Um, so for example, let's say I was playing a blues and let's take the, the last chords going into the two chord, right? So the, the A minor seven going to the D seven There's not, you can play all blues over this, really over the reharms, depending upon the reharms. So like, if I were to play A7 alter, if I, if I use a secondary dominance and I play dominant, altered, 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 I can use blues for the most part over th those chords. Now the thing is, it gets tricky. The the my my recommendation would be to you is when you start to add the minor chords in. When you start to add minors in, that's when you're going to want to change your sound to kind of mold more to that key. So what I specifically mean is the relative two minors. Like the sus, you can still use blues over this. It's going to be a little out. I would probably switch your blues scale to more of a majory blues sound. And then over this as well. Like the full major blues scale is what I went over last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember, but that's gonna be one, two, flat three, natural three, five, six, one. This is gonna fit more than the blues scale because if I play an A sus here, right, I wanna, my, my improvisation over my sus is gonna be a lot different than my A7. This is a really, actually a great question. I should do a podcast all on this because recognition of what you, what sound is going to kind of like help your approach is really, really key. And this comes with practice and more understanding, but my sus sound, right, is gonna be much different than my blues. So if I play blues over this, listen to how it sounds. It doesn't sound that great. Whereas like if I play my F major blues, it sounds a little closer, okay? But still not that close, right? But again, this sus chord, right? We can use a lot of different tools to solo over sus, okay? And so essentially, you know, I don't wanna get into all of those, but we would outline those chord chords more. So like you could, a very quick way to solo over sus is to use the Dorian of the relative two minor. For example, if I'm the key of C, let me just demonstrate in C so I can show you guys. If I'm playing a G sus, I would use D Dorian. Or essentially mixolydian. You can, but like I like to think about it in terms of D Dorian because it outlines this chord tone more, if that makes sense. So, like if I play a sus chord, my chord tones now are one, four, five, seven. If I'm thinking in terms of mixolydian, 
my three chord is very prevalent in the Mixolydian scale, meaning if I go one, two, three, I'm hitting a three where I'm playing a four. That's why I like to think Dorian, because the chord tones to a Dorian chord, a Dorian mode, or the which you know um, is the sibling of this chord here, is that C natural, which fits with my sus, my G sus. So I think more in terms of D Dorian, and I think about these chord tones, right? Now, obviously, you can use pentatonics and such like that. But again, the sus chord is you want to start to think about more, especially in the blues format, right? And then the 2-5. So if I go 3, excuse me, yeah, 3 minor, 6, and then I go tritone here, but I put the relative 2. So I could go 3, 6, relative 2, tritone into the 2. Over this 2-5, E-flat minor 7 to A-flat 7, or G sharp seven, as the notation software says, I want to think more in terms of this key that I'm in. So I'm going to think more in terms of D flat here. So I'd play like D Dorian, excuse me, E flat Dorian here, moving to A flat seven. And again, for a more simple approach, you can just think D flat major because it's coming from the key of D flat. But the reason I'm changing my approach is because these are so far outside the key of F that I have to add like two fives, you should always group together. Anytime you have like a 2-5, it can change depending upon the key you're in, but especially with reharms, if I go this, A minor 7, and then I move to the key of D flat, it's going to be a significant change. Do you hear how different that is? Huge change. So, you know, more or less, I would play kind of a 2-5 motion here, approach Dorian to Mixolydian. Right? So that's more in the key of just the 2 5, the minor to the dominant. Right? Now, here, I wouldn't resolve to that because we're going to the key of D flat. So now I need to start thinking about how I'm going to resolve to a chord tone in the key of D flat. Right? And then I'm going to move to my E flat minor. So now my main challenge, mathematical challenge, is with the amount of beats I have. This is in the bebop, uh, the, P the bebop um, formula equation. I can't remember the name of the mini course. The bebop equation. Uh, we're, we're thinking about the number of beats we have left in the measure. Now I have two... I have four and one, and I need to get to a chord tone for E flat minor seven. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be a chord tone, but you should start with that and then move to just landing with something within the key. So I'd play this. One and two, no, I'm sorry, three and four and one. So now I've hit a, I've hit a chord tone. Now I'd move through my, my chord scales within D flat. then I need to land and move back to the key of F to my two chord, my minor chord. Right? So my, my motion to get back to G minor was this. So that's what brought me back to the key of G to the key. Well, not the key, but like my F blues, my G minor. Whoops, I'm playing in a different key. Now, this is happening much faster. I'm extending the rhythms here, obviously, to give motion. But again, this would be a measure. One, one, two, th no, I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We have two beats each of every chord, right? So it sounds good. In the flow, I'm able to flow through the harmonies because of the way that I'm approaching chord tones in my improv improvisation on the downbeat when the chord changes. You hear how seamless that is when I just land on a chord tone moving into my reharm? My E flat minor seven, I'm landing on the seven. It's so seamless. 
Like it sounds so smooth and great because of this basic principle that so many people overlook. Now I can do this in so many different ways because I've practiced this concept so many times. And this is why I kind of spend so much time on this concept with all my jazz piano school students, right? Because it, you start to sound seamless in your playing. That wasn't the best, let me try something else. I love going to the sharp 11, by the way, on dominant chords, it sounds really nice. I can go back down to the third, excuse me, the fourth. Again, this is more advanced players can land on any note within the key and resolve somehow. Right? I could do that. Let me try something else. I could go up to the fifth. Right? And then I'm approaching the two of my G minor seven. And that's how you get these like strings of bebop sounds that kind of like flow in and out of different harmonies and reharms and you're just like, wow, what is what is even happening there? Um, someone asked about the band members. The band members need to be aware of this. No, they don't have to be aware of this, which is the funny thing. Um, especially in a blues, but like if you, I would say if there's a written composition and you're trying to add in all these reharms, you should talk to the composer. Like if you're playing in a group, uh, you definitely don't need to inform the group. And if a bass player is more advanced, he'll catch these with you, believe it or not. Honestly, I've had, I've had bass players, really good bass players catch things. And I'm just like, how are you? Cause they can, they can hear the root motion. Like a lot of time, like I said before, I love going to, I love going to the, just the five instead of the one on the blues. Like when we get back to the top, I love playing the C minor. So like, here's the turnaround. Here's the top. I'll go to C minor. And I'll go to my tritone, so I'll go C minor, tritone, four, sharp four diminished, one over five. And then I'll go back up to the tritone. This is the tritone of G7, which is the secondary dominant of C. So check out the root motion here. I'm going diminished, five over, one over five, tritone, one over five, tritone. So like I'm playing this, right? That's at the beginning, the top of the blues. Here's my turnaround. When people start blowing real hard, sounds better in a group, but sounds good solo piano too. <laughs> I like playing in groups better than I do solo piano, to be honest with you. Um, I just like feeding off the other musicians. Uh, what was the question? Oh yeah, <laughs> no. So you don't need to. You don't need to let people know. Um, and I use, trust me, like I'll, these, again, these are very, very advanced mental concepts. Like I'll suggest root motion to the bass player, hope, hoping that they can catch it. You know, like I'll play bass notes with my left hand, suggest certain movements. Like I'm going to go here with my left hand. If there's a less experienced bass player or like that I know is not as experienced with me, you know, uh, if I'm playing with a really high professional group, I won't know how to do this. I can just voice the chord, you know play these I can play rootless voicings and they'll hear the movement but with younger bass players or just less talented bass skilled bass players I should say not talented um, knowledgeable right I'll, I'll suggest roots to them so I'll go like I'll literally put that in their face I mean it's kind of rude but I want them to start hearing these progressions, like hearing these reharms and movements so that they can understand that there's there's much more that can happen, right? Uh, what's the best way to practice all of this? Exactly, that's the question, is it not? David, I'll get to your question in just one second. I just wanna say, isolate each 
in every reharm by itself. Okay. My theory sequence process is the four steps, theory, technique, improvisation, and repertoire. So you want to understand back to our tool analogy. You want to understand each tool by itself, right? So you should understand a tritone sub to its fullest by itself. You should be able to move it and wield that tool by itself, not within a tune, just on the piano. Like any tritone, like you should be able to, if you play a G7, you should be able to go to the tritone of the G7 immediately, instantly, without thinking. Right? Jump to that. And you should be able to do it with more complicated voicings as well. So whatever your voicing level is, you want to use those. So practice this. So if your voicing level is root, is root position voicings, then just use root position voicings. Right? And pick any chord, A flat 7. You should be able to jump. Now, if, you're, if your voicing level is rootless voicings, use rootless voicings. See that? I'm playing G7 rootless to D flat 7 rootless. Or I'm playing A7 rootless to E flat 7 rootless. I'm switching between tritones. Now, you should also be able to do this in a 2-5-1. Two, two, tritone, one, through all chords. Two, tritone, one. Two, tritone, one. That is the mastery of each chord. Right, and that's that's being able to wield one tool to its full potential. Now, when you can wield each one of those reharms, like they should be as fluid as using a word that you're commonly familiar with: park, walk, dog. When we use these words, we don't have to think about using the words. Sorry, Bruce. Let me go back to this real quick. So, if I were to use G7, I would go to my tritone of G7. If my, my level of voicings is root position, then just use root position chords to practice this. I would also practice by two five ones. Two, this is all root position now. Root position, root position, root position. If your level of chords is higher than that with rootless voicings, then use rootless voicings. Rootless, rootless, right? That's just playing tritone subs, okay? So here's my two five one, rootless, rootless. Rootless, both structures. Sorry, my 13 there. This is structure two. Oh no, I'm sorry. It is it is um, natural five on top, right? So whatever you're, and then if you're more advanced, you can do drop twos, or you can just do drop twos of your tritone. So what I did here is my drop two of my G7. Right, here's my G7 drop two, and then I'm moving to my D flat seven drop two. And then try a different chord, right? So on and so forth. So isolate each reharm tool. Then after you've learned to master each tool, that's when you want to start to combine them. Okay, this is going to allow for optimal freedom over this concept of reharms which will allow you to improvise over all of the reharms that you do. I used to write these down. Write out your reharm equations, your formulas, right? All right, David says, what would be the most efficient ways to practice these? Oh, oh okay, I, I was kind of answering that. <clears throat> so just to be very clear, before you practice them in a blues, you want to isolate the tools like I was just mentioning and work them through the exercises I was showing you if you guys are all members, whoever's a member of Jazz Piano School, these exercises are within Jazz Piano School. Okay, all the exercises you need for each and every reharm outside of tunes is within Jazz Piano School. Okay, just type in the name of the reharm and you'll find it. You'll find all the exercises you need to fully integrate that tool into your being, right? So that you can use it freely like writing a sentence, like saying, I want to go to the park. I want to go to the store. Right? It should be as natural as speaking sentences. Right, when we're, when we're playing on the piano, we're speaking. We're playing a language. These tools should just be like learning vocab words or using sentences or learning how to use verbs in a sentence, in simple sentences. <clears throat> After I've done that, then we can start to integrate them into the blues. Right? So David, if you have one of these tools <clears throat> to the fullest, you can move them through the exercises I just showed you at different level, different voicing levels, right? Or improvisation levels. Then at that point, after you've done these exercises, tritone, tritone, right? 
tritone, 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 right? Whatever it is. To start to implement them into the blues slowly, map out the reharm you want to take. So if you want to start to implement the tritone, map out that you're going to go one, tritone, four. Maybe you do the tritone of the four. Tritone, right? Back into the one. And then with whatever voicings you're comfortable with, whatever level voicing system that you're at, start to use those voicings over that reharm you've planned out. So the voicings I used were drop two-ish with the root in the bass. Now drop two can be by itself or playing solo piano or comping, I can also add the root in my left hand, which gives it a thicker sound. Remember, if I play the drop twos without that root, here's what it sounds like. And I would use these if I was playing with a bass player, but when I'm playing solo piano, I gotta add that root in. Right? So I'd put on a backing track, David, map out the reharms you're gonna play with the particular voicings that you're comfortable with and start to work them in. Right now, after you've mapped it out, the way you want to get spontaneous with it is start to use them in different places that you wouldn't be expecting. But by practicing them in a specific places to start, you'll grow comfortable with the spontaneity of just using them in random places in the blues. Right. But you have to practice them isolated first. So, for example, if you get to your your turnaround here, going to the two chord, try some of the turnarounds that I was showing you before. E flat seven, D seven, G minor. So now I'd practice that. Right? And that's how you'd start to implement them into the blues slowly, but in a controlled environment. That's gonna help you progress rather than hinder your progress, okay? <clears throat> I think we have a couple more questions here. I think I've got to most of them. Place line says, what it what it's the most distant key you could go this reharm that still sounds good? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> that's a great question. I mean, with with the use of secondary dominance, you can go through, you can cycle, literally cycle through keys. Uh, because the secondary dominance lead to another dominant chord. Like again, if let's check this out. If I have a C7, I can go through all keys by using secondary dominance. What do I mean by that? I can play a secondary dominant that leads to C. What chord would that be? That would be G7. So I can go G7, C7. Now, if I want to put a secondary dominant before my G7, that would be D7. So my D7 leads to G7, which leads to C7. If I want to play a secondary dominant that leads to D7, what would that be? A7. A7, D7, G7, C7. It's cyclic, right? Now, I can do two fives for all of those. Right, so if I have E minor going to A7, I could go E minor, A7, A minor, A7, D minor, G7, right? G minor, C7. I've now used the relative two over all of these. Right, and the bridge to rhythm changes, this is exactly what this sounds like. The bridge to rhythm changes is four dominant chords with lots of room to reharm to your heart's extent. Right, so we have D, G, C. We have the exact pattern I'm talking about. So I can reharm all these. Right, so that was just two fives. Two, A minor seven, D seven. D minor 7, G7. This creates a beautiful, beautiful movement. Here I went, I 
added another reharm on top of that, <laughs> right? And again, you could do so many things. I'm, right now, I, I can go down all my half, whole st uh, half steps. This is the bridge to rhythm changes. This would bring us back to the B flat. So I'm going A minor seven, D seven, A flat minor seven, D flat seven, G minor seven, C seven, F sharp minor seven, B seven. All right, so I could solo over all this. I love the I love the Errol style, right? And then back to B flat. <laughs> and then finally you resolve to B flat. But when this comes up in rhythm changes, like when you're playing rhythm changes, it's really fun. So here's my bridge. Now you can comp like that. Um, a lot of times when I'm soloing, I'll take that. Hopefully the bass player hears me, right? I love soloing over this progression for the bridge. As you could just see, like I love going to that and people are like, what, where is he getting this from? Well, you all now know now where I'm getting it from, right? But other people are like, how, where is this coming from, right? The power of reharms, it's very, very powerful. <laughs> all right, and, and everything is coupled together. It's like, you know, combined. So I have my right hand improv with textures and then, you know, I have the reharms happening. I have my aerial texture. So at the base of this, like what you're hearing is a combination of all these different types of things coming together at once. But you, have, you must study each concept individually first before you can start to combine them. Okay. Maximilian, my best friend has a son named Maximilian. How do you come up with different chords, voicing, etc., over many bars of the same chord when you have to solo, for example, a long time over F major seven so it doesn't get boring? Guys, I'll answer this last question. I'm going to head out. I'm getting kind of hungry and thirsty. <laughs> There's lots of different ways, Maximilian, to do this. Um, <clears throat> so, again, as I've been talking a lot since 2021, your primary objective is to, you want to split your goals. Okay, Max? So, essentially, if your goal is to play solo piano, the question you're asking me is going to be completely different than the question that you'd be asked if someone was asking to play in a group, right? Comping in a group as opposed to playing solo piano is two completely separate paths. So you have to nail down your goal. Like, what is your goal? Are you trying to, are you trying to play this F major seven chord solo piano or comping? Okay. So I'll show you both. If you have, if you're playing solo piano, for example, depending upon the style or the tempo, that's going to dictate a lot as well with your ballad. You can move around a lot slowly. And what I do is I jump from my bass because we want to keep hearing that bass note. And then I'll play lot different types of inversions up here in my left hand. Maybe some different extensions, right? But I always go back to my one and five or my bass. See what my left hand's doing here? So my left hand over solo piano, over this stride style, over a ballad, like there's so many different layers everyone has to think about. Now, if I were playing a medium upswing tempo that wasn't a ballad, it would probably sound like this.
I'm moving into different types of textures, right? And again, that's if I would that's all solo piano though. If I don't have to accompany myself with the bass, my whole approach changes. So you kind of have to kind of hierarchy your learning system. That's why jazz piano school is so effective because you need to take in these different layers in your path. And then if, as long as you take the right path, you can get to your goals very, very fast, but in specific elements. All right, so if I were comping, I can use drop twos that move down to my inversions. I can use fourths. I can think more about textures. And again, it's all about textures at this point. If you're if you if you have one major seven chord, remember your major seven chord doesn't have that much room for reharm because it's not a dominant chord and it's not a minor chord. Your major sevens, you can add different colors. You know, I can go to my diminished. But again, it, it it's not going to move that much. So your your goal here, Max, is to is to really go for your textures. You know how you play certain things. Um, get creative, your slides, your octaves, your dynamics, your movements. That's what's going to keep things spicy and interesting when you have one chord that's just staying there. Now you can do certain passing chords like that, but again, like it depends on the tune as well. If you have a tune that's more modern, okay, you, those passing chords aren't really going to be there, but if you have like a two-bar two, two f bar phrase that's just sitting on an F major 7 chord, um... I'm trying to think of a tune. I can't think of a tune off my head. But anyway, <laughs> hopefully that helps. If you have more of a bebop type tune that lands on the F chord, like... That would be a passing chord. So I'm going F major, G minor, A flat diminished, A. <clears throat> All right, guys, last question. <laughs> I always like staying to, to answer as many questions as possible. So could you respond to this last latest question? How can you play with a modern style over a blues like playing outside or using compound cells? Place line. So uh, no discords, no real music. Um, so place line. To make anything more modern, you need to understand the modern textures, which are more sus and less bebop. Um, so if I were to play more of a modern blues, I'm going to be using different tools. I'm going to be using type, type hexatonic, pentatonic scales in modern voicing. So sus. I'm going to be using a lot of sus chords. And my improv approach is going to be less bebop because bebop is an older style, right? Bebop is coming from earlier 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And then we move into this more modern style of approach that's, you know, uh, Herbie, Chick, all these guys are getting into McCoy that have developed and created. That's why they're historic figures in jazz because they created this, they created the sound. Now coupled with reharms, I can do a lot, but like my approach with certain tools, I'm gonna change my tools to answer your question. I'm going to use more hexatonic, pentatonic lines, and I'm going to solo over sus reharms, right? And so that's how I want to develop a more modern style, you know, that's kind of playing more outside the sound in a specific blues. Now, I can also use different tools like altered scale. I can use half whole. I wouldn't use those over my sus, but if I choose to use a dominant chord, any sort of colors or extensions is going to change the chord. So if I use like... Um, if I play a blues with a sharp 11 and a flat 13, you know, it's going to sound very different. Right? That sounds already like very dissonant and out. If I'm using altered chords the entire time.
And then obviously was sus and stuff like that. So to answer your question, it's a combination of tools, right? Improv tools coupled with reharm tools. That's going to bring your sound outside of bebop. Sus, sus improv approaches like hexatonic, pentatonic, and then your ability to solo over the reharms you're creating. So if you play an F sus, which moves to your tritone sus, your ability to solo over those sus chords is going to create a more out sound. Hopefully that helps. Um, place line. Yes, no problem. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks so much. Um, I think a lot of you have heard this, but I'm going to be starting a uh, our highest form of education that we've offered at Jazz Piano School, which will be working with myself privately and my team of educators in a group format. And we're only taking 20 students. If you guys are interested in getting on that list to hear more details, go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash group. I'm going to be sending out details very, very soon. And um, essentially, if that if they're agreeable to you and your schedule and the price, then you can apply to be the to be in the group. OK, there is an application process because I want to make sure the group is engaging, positive, energetic, supportive and creating a very nice community to help all of our fellow musicians get better and learn jazz piano and be great at this amazing craft. OK, so again, if you're interested, it doesn't commit you to anything. Go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash group and you can get on the waiting list and just hear the details and again if you're satisfied with the details and it sounds like something you might be interested in you can then apply to be in the group okay hope you guys have a great time have a great thursday evening probably for a lot of you afternoon mid evening for me um and that's it i'll have more live stuff coming up soon um, and just keep your eyes posted on the emails for all that okay thanks so much and happy practicing